Hello everybody, I'm Zenith Variant GAY25, although my friends call me Zenith Warrior Princess, the cutest of ghost buns, and welcome once again to Bun Plays, where rolling is a myth, and I try to go through every single Sonic the Hedgehog game ever made. This was a mistake. In any case, it's been more than enough time since we completed the first game here on Bun Plays, so I figured it's about time we get started on the Blue Blur's second foray on the Sega Genesis. Like before, I wanted to offer up a quick primer before heading into the Let's Play proper as a way to understand what went into the game and the mindset that players had during this point in the franchise. For example, last time we discussed a lot of Sega's history instead of Sonic, since Sonic was the new man in town. I know many questioned the decision to have an entire portion of the last primer dedicated specifically to Mario, but you see, that context is extremely crucial to understanding the landscape of the gaming industry at the time of Sonic's arrival. With that said though, today's primer will be much more focused on the phenomenon that Sonic became following his first game, and how that pressure tied into the production of his second entry. Which unfortunately means that we won't be seeing any more of Sega's Yakuza background, but eh, what you gonna do? So without any further ado, let's dive into the history of one of the best Genesis games of all time, Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Nobody could have predicted the success that Sonic 1 would eventually achieve given Sega's previous history. Amidst their constant bankruptcy, criminal behavior, and shifting company goals, children at the time were not ready for Sonic when he first debuted. The focus at the time was mainly on the arcade market, where people were casually playing games that would only capture their attention for so long. Even Nintendo, with hits like Donkey Kong, had short games that were easy to pick up and understand. When the focus shifted to the home market in the early 90s, this changed everything about how game companies did business. Now it wasn't a matter of having kids chuck a few quarters at an arcade, but rather expecting the parents of children to spend hundreds of dollars on one gaming system. This meant that, realistically, there was a far more limited market because most families could only afford one system. You had to choose. Were you going to get a Neo Geo for $600, which is the equivalent of $1,293 today, a Super Nintendo for $200, which is $400 in today's money, or a Sega Genesis for $337, or $651 today. Yeah, it seems obvious at just a glance that the Super Nintendo was poised to win this particular console war, with the Neo Geo destined to be forgotten, because who the hell could have afforded that in the early 90s? Nintendo had the marketing and the pricing to match, but out of nowhere, Sega came out swinging by dropping the price of the Genesis to $150 to beat out the Super Nintendo, with Sonic being packaged with it just for good measure. Created by designer Hirozaka Yasuhara, who is the game planner of Altered Beast, along with programmer Yuji Naka and artist Naoto Ushima, Sonic originated from a tech demo in a contest held by Sega to determine their flagship title. This led to a prototype platform game, 
that involved a fast-moving character rolling into a ball through a long, winding tube. After Yasuhara joined the project, the focus was shifted to the protagonist, which Sega was hoping to be a mascot that would rival Mario himself. Hayao Nakayama, Sega of Japan's president at the time, recognized that porting arcade games wasn't enough and that they needed their own mascot in order to compete and one that could demonstrate the power of Sega's hardware. With this in mind and a focus on an American audience, they designed their new mascot, Sonic the Rabbit. Yep, Sonic was originally designed as a rabbit with prehensile ears that could grab objects, making him an honorary member of the Bun Squad. See, I didn't just pull Sonic out of a hat at random. I had him be the mascot of Bun Plays for a reason, damn it! Anyway, this proved too complex for the hardware at the time, so the team moved on to other animals that could roll into a ball, such as armadillos and hedgehogs, the latter of which they eventually settled on for their mascot. Sonic's color was chosen to match Sega's cobalt blue logo, and his red and white shoes were inspired by the cover of Michael Jackson's 1987 album Bad. The team and Nakayama must have been huge fans of his, given what would happen with Sonic 3's eventual development. Sonic's personality was also based on Bill Clinton's can-do attitude, which just makes me imagine Sonic on trial for crimes that he committed as President of the United States. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Interestingly enough though, Dr. Robotnik, who is known as Eggman in Japan, was another character Oshima had designed for the contest as a possible mascot, based on Teddy Roosevelt of all people. So we have Bill Clinton versus Teddy Roosevelt and his Rough Riders. God, this puts Sonic in a very weird light, cause it makes sense given the robots and Teddy's propensity to invade Cuba, but it's just so weird to think about having played the game. When the game finally launched in June of 91 and became a monster success for the company, President and CEO of Sega of America, Tom Kalinske, decided to approach the company's Japanese team with the idea to bundle Sonic with the Genesis in the US, complete with a reduced price of 149 US dollars. This apparently did not go over well with the Japanese board, who devolved into madness moments later, thinking that Kalinsky was out of his mind for supposedly giving away their best title. As the room went into a heated Japanese argument, that Kalinsky couldn't understand because he didn't speak Japanese, Nakayama was said to have kicked a chair over in anger in response to the board's negativity. As he left the room, he reassured his faith in Kalinsky and approved of the plan. This was honestly the best decision they could have ever made, as the combination of the now cheaper price of the Genesis compared to the Super Nintendo, and the best game that Sega had ever made up to that point, gave the company the edge they needed in the console wars. Suddenly, Mario wasn't the coolest kid in school anymore, but just a runner-up as Sonic began to dominate with a 2-3 lead over Nintendo. All the cool kids had a Genesis, and the rivalry was going quite strong. As I stated before, I was a Nintendo kid at the time, but my cousin had the Sega Genesis, and I was just so damn jealous. I was really bad at Nintendo games as a kid, considering the reflexes they asked for you to have for many of those games. And while I adored Super Mario 1 and 3, Sega was just more appealing to me back then. 
I just wasn't any good at Super Mario World, and Genesis had Aladdin, The Lion King, Batman, and many other movie licensed games that I adored watching in action. Then there was Sonic the Hedgehog, taunting me with his attitude from far away where I couldn't play his game. The interesting thing, though, is that my cousin never acquired Sonic 2 or 3. I'm not sure why, but the next Sonic game we played together was Sonic 3D Blast, and that... was weird, to say the least. So we went back to trying and failing to beat the Lion King instead. No, my personal history with Sonic 2 happened much later on, which we'll discuss in a little bit. As far as the game's production is concerned, while Sonic 1 ended up as a huge success for Sega, Yuji Naka was dissatisfied with his treatment at the company and felt that he received little credit for his involvement and the game's success. Because of this, Naka quit Sega of Japan, where he was hired by Mark Cerny to work at the Sega Technical Institute in America, where he was granted a higher salary and more creative freedom. Yasuhara also moved to STI, making me think that Sega of Japan was still up to their old Yakuza ways. Considering what happened with Nakayama, I'm surprised more chairs were knocked over because of it. Oshima, on the other hand, stayed with Sega of Japan to work on what would eventually become Sonic CD. Despite the success of Sonic 1, Sega of Japan was slow to approve a sequel before directing Cerny to start producing Sonic 2 in November of 1992, five months after the release of the first game. For some strange reason, Sega management considered it too soon to release a sequel, which Cerny attributes to marketing executives not understanding game development. Sega of America was also hesitant due to their lack of confidence in the Sonic character. I mean, surely Kid Chameleon is going to outsell the blue blur. Still, they eventually greenlit Sonic 2, and with Yasuhara and Naka moving to California to oversee development, it seemed as if Sonic 2 would be even bigger and better than the original game. In fact, Sonic 2 was intended to be faster and far more ambitious than the first game ever was. However, things did not go according to plan, and Sonic 2 suffered several major setbacks that really hurt its development. The first major hurdle was lost development time. Sonic 2 was pitched in September of 1991, but wasn't greenlit until November, giving them only nine months of development time, as the company wanted it as a holiday 1992 release. This didn't pose quite as big a hurdle, according to Cerny, as they had yet to come up with an idea on par with Sonic, but this meant a lot of crunch time to get this project done by the holidays. Another major hurdle was the shift in staff size. Sonic 2's development team was far larger than the previous game, consisting mostly of Japanese developers and some American staff. The language barrier between the differing staff made explaining concepts difficult since the American staff could not speak Japanese at the time, but the more pressing issue was that the Japanese developers had issues moving to California with their visas. According to Cerny, Sega had applied for O-1 visas, unaware that the Japanese developers did not qualify meaning that development began with the American team only for a period of time until the staff could officially get their visas. Further problems arose due to the cultural differences 
between staff members, considering how vastly different Japanese work environments were from American at the time. The Japanese developers were used to crunch conditions, with Cerny noting that they often worked through the night and slept in their cubicles. Level artist Craig Stitt called lead artist Yasushi Yamaguchi a machine who worked long hours and repeatedly reworked other artists' levels to ensure game quality. Stitt stated that Yasuhara was easy to work with, but Naka was, and I quote, an arrogant pain in the ass, end quote, not interested in working with Americans. Artist Tim Skelly said that Naka would have been happier working with an all-Japanese team, which is just... Yikes. Just... Wow. This was a lot. And because of all of the crunch, the difficulty working with each other, and everything else, Cerny left during development of Sonic 2. Partly because of the rising tensions between the Japanese and American developers, feeling the Americans were not treated respectfully. Cerny did have a point when the Japanese developers were calling the Americans lazy for going home over the weekend and seeing their families. Look, no matter what cultural differences exist, crunch is never a good thing. And unfortunately, it has now been outsourced to American studios, and that is not okay. I love my current job, but my job is not my life, and we deserve time to decompress from the pressures of work. Further complicating this was SDI's involvement with the Sonic franchise and Naka's desire to oversee development personally, as well as Sega of America's initial hesitation to assist given their lack of confidence in the Sonic character. I mean, after the Japanese branch made a ton of noise about the US bundling the first game with the Genesis, only for it to pay off big time, how much would you be willing to trust their word on things like this? Executive Masaharu Yoshi was installed as temporary head of STI and was credited as Sonic 2's director, although Naka would probably take issue with that. Yoshi said that the situation was severe because Sega of America was, and I quote, betting everything on Sonic 2, but the STI staff did not display any stress and remained optimistic that the project would be finished on time. Unfortunately, this led to a lot of cut content, with everything going on behind the scenes. With nine months to make the game, and the director leaving halfway through the project, they had to make some sacrifices. I will delve into more of this cut content soon, but according to the marketing director Al Nilsson, Sonic 2 probably could have been three times the size if everything was left in the game. Hidden Palace Zone, Wood Zone, Genocide City Zone. God, that's metal as all hell. There's just so much that got cut, which is just crazy considering what we got from the actual release. On a personal level though, Sonic 2 was an interesting experience for me because I actually got to play this as a child and not at my cousin's house. I am not sure how old I was, probably early teenage years at most, but when I was perhaps around 11 or 12, I started to go to a summer camp at the YMCA. There were some interesting programs available for kids back then that I attended, including karate camp, skateboarding camp, and video game camp. Yeah, that was an actual thing. I went to all of these, 
since I was into extreme sports at the time, even though I wasn't really good at them, but the video game camp was the coolest one of them all. I remember playing Spyro the Dragon in camp, but the highlight for me was playing Sonic 2 with a bunch of friends and absolutely falling in love with the game. I wasn't very good at it at the time, only getting as far as Mystic Cave Zone before losing all my lives, but man, this was a magical experience as a kid. I finally got to play one of my most anticipated games, and I adored it. I loved the music, the level design, and the bosses. Everything just clicked into place for me when I played it for the first time. And while those memories have somewhat faded over the years, I remember my sheer joy and delight playing through Sonic 2 at video game camp. It was honestly a lot like the N64 kid when he first opened it at Christmas time. Later on in life, I found Sonic 2 digitally on the PS3 and in Sonic's Ultimate Genesis Collection, which were decent ports with save states, but I still do have my issues with them. For one thing, the Ultimate Genesis Collection port only lists jumping and moving as an option and not rolling, which explains why I had no idea it existed for the longest time. To be perfectly frank, I still think rolling is a myth, and I'll have to check out the manual this time and see if that changes things this go around. So with all that out of the way, let's take a journey down memory lane as we play through Sonic 2 on the Sonic Origins Collection and ask a very important question. Was Sonic 2 really as good as I remember it being all those years ago? And does it hold up despite all of these development troubles that I didn't know at the time? As previously, you can catch the Let's Play over on Bun Squad Gaming where new episodes will be released every Monday until it is done. With all that being said, I'm Zenith Warrior Princess, the cutest of ghost buns, gearing up to add another game to the Haunted Gaming Library. Have a good one, everybody.